for you all here, but we're, we're the Faculty for Homeless and Inclusion Health is starting to explore uh, a sort of subscription model. So we want to keep the faculty free to, uh, to, to particularly to, to experts by experience and, and, uh, and, 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 be, and people on low wages. Um, but we're, we're hoping to coax our members towards a kind of voluntary subscription model. Um, uh, and the way to do that, if you feel so inclined, is to go to the Pathway um, website and then click on the faculty link and then the subscribe link from there. Uh, and uh, that will give you the opportunity of, of setting up a, a, a standing order um, and uh, um, making that into a gift aided donation to, to the charity, which will help to complete to, to allow this fabulous organisation to, uh, to, to continue into the future. Um, lovely to see so many people join, uh, joining in. Oh, I see John's, John's pictures on down there. Um, I'm sure you, you're all much more used to Zoom than I am, but there is there's the top right, there's a, there's a toggle between speaker view and um, uh, whatever the other, yeah, gallery view. So the, the gallery view shows you kind of everybody um, and speaker view uh, hopefully gives you the, the person who's, uh, who's, who's most recently speaking. Um, so nice to see all those introductions appearing in the uh, Zoom room chat. People from all over the shop, which is uh, which is which is brilliant. That's uh, exciting to see. Uh, this again, you know, we're trying to think of think about positives in the current situation. Previously, we've had the faculty meetings around the country. You know, the, the most you, you tend to get most people attending at the London meetings because that's generally easier to get to and uh, and smaller attendances on the south coast and the east coast or, or up in the north but obviously now we can we can all get together from where, wherever we are and, uh, and and share information um so i'm sure this is going to be something we're going to be uh, looking forward to uh, to doing in the future so we're coming up to five past so i think we should um start to think about making a formal uh, start to proceedings so welcome, I'm Nigel Hewitt, I'm Medical Director of Pathway Charity and Secretary to the Faculty for Homeless and Inclusion Health. Uh, as everybody's joining, it's lovely to see you all and you've obviously all got the, uh, got the idea, keep your microphones on mute and use the Zoom Room chat button at the bottom uh, to introduce yourselves and, and say hi and then ask questions as, as you're going along. If you think of a question, bung it in the, in the chat room and I'll try and collate those questions so we can ask the, the, the speakers at the end. Uh, we've got three speakers today, uh, Emmett Roberts from London, John Budd from Edinburgh and then Alex Bax who's the Chief Executive of Pathway. Um, and I think what we'll do now is, is, is make a start. Um, what we're, we're looking at is, is innovations driven by the, by the pandemic with a particular focus on uh, substance misuse treatment. Um, and what I'd suggest that you do is, 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 is put this on speaker view so that you'll, you'll, you'll see, see Emmett. Although, in fact, this um, Mahjong table of, of, of pictures is also quite entertaining. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to invite Emmett Roberts uh, from the London Homeless Hotels Drug and Alcohol Support Service uh, to begin his presentation. Thanks, Emmett. Hi, guys. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, um, I'm Emmett. So I'm, um, I'm an addiction psychiatrist by, by trade. Um, and I've sort of found myself swept up in uh, the general COVID response here in London. Um, so I thought I'd just um, set the scene a little bit um, and then tell you about our service that we've been running over the last sort of three and a bit months. So when, when the outbreak happened, there were two sort of relevant bits of national sort of policy directives that happened in England. The first of which was um, a general relaxation in the rules around opiate prescribing. So generally when people come to specialist substance misuse services uh, and are initiated onto opiate substitution medications such as methadone or buprenorphine, um, typically they have to go to a pharmacy and pick it up every day um, uh, under the watchful eye of a, of a dispensing pharmacist. Um, and those, those restrictions have relaxed a lot um, in, in light of the epidemic given uh, that we obviously didn't want people to be congregating in, uh, in pharmacies and we wanted to restrict social movement. So we moved to a much more individualized based risk system where uh, people were um, having more, less frequent pickups, so getting more supplies of their methadone or their buprenorphine to take home with them, um, and fewer people were having supervision. So basically there was a lot more methadone and buprenorphine sort of around the system more opiates filling around there. And then the second big policy, which I'm sure um, 
the vast majority of you will be familiar with is, is everyone in. So the, the edict from central government to um, house everyone or temporarily house everyone who is experiencing rough sleeping. Um, uh, and the way that we've achieved, or the way that that's been achieved in um, London is through temporary accommodation in a variety of hotels. And that's been facilitated by both local authorities in London, but also the, the GLA, the Greater London Authority, who is a, a sort of centralised body that, that sits above the local authorities. Um, now, I'm sure you've all struggled to get people into substance misuse treatment in the past. We are a weird, wonderful network of, uh, of services that have myriad problems in terms, of, in terms of access, even at the best of times. Um, so local substance misuse treatment services are commissioned and run by local authorities. Um, so each individual local authority provides a substance misuse service. And in a place like London, we have 33 different boroughs, so 33 local authorities, a separate drug and alcohol uh, service for each of those uh, local authorities. Um, and so it can be very different, difficult for service users and for professionals, honestly, to, um, to navigate that system as to who should be going to which service. And so at the very beginning of the, of the outbreak, when people were being housed in hotels, uh, it was understood that there would be difficulty in people accessing the substance misuse treatment network, but also there was going to be a huge degree of substance misuse comorbidity within this population uh, who were being housed in hotels. So based on previous work, we estimated roughly that probably about 80% of people smoke tobacco, about 50% of people in the hotels were going to have some kind of problem with alcohol. Uh, and about Can you hear me all right? would have um, yep. some kind of Hold problem. Hold on a minute, I'm in a Zoom thing at the moment, so I'll need to finally find a way of getting out of it. <laughs> um, so, sorry, could you put your uh, mics on mute if you're, if you're not me? <laughs> sorry. Um, where was I? Yes, yeah, so, so PHE um, and, and about 20% of people would have some kind of problems with opiates or, or, um, or other drugs. And so Public Health England London, together with the GLA, commissioned uh, for the first time ever a Pan London uh, drug and alcohol support service for this hotel group. So we, we're called HJAS London, so the Homeless Hotel Drug and Alcohol Service. Um, uh, and I found myself um, becoming the clinical lead for that service uh, around about three months ago. So we're a partnership. We um, uh, are run by uh, NHS trusts. Uh, so I normally work for South London and the Maudsley NHS Trust, but we, uh, the HDAS is provided on a cross provider network. So NHS trusts and also uh, the substance misuse charities providing care in London. So that includes CGL, Turning Point, We Are With You, WDP, the Westminster Drugs Project, uh, and Phoenix Futures. Um, and yeah, so we developed a service over the last sort of three and a half months, and I'll just tell you a little bit about what we've been doing and what we've found, and then very happy to take any questions. So I, I guess the service has done sort of three main things. So the first is we've set up a single point of contact for anyone in the hotel system to communicate with us about any drug and alcohol queries whatsoever. So um, anyone who's working in the hotels, so that's normally voluntary sector organizations or healthcare practitioners, can phone us or email us and go, I don't know what to do about this person who is, has a substance misuse problem or I want to find out about their prescription or how do I get hold of their methadone or what's going on with this spice malarkey, those kind of questions. Um, and so, yeah, we have a, we have a dedicated um, two recovery substance misuse workers on the phone every day who can escalate problems to myself or the rest of the team if needs be. And in the early days, it was uh, a lot about getting people into the hotels who perhaps hadn't been able to access the, the hotel network um, or and a lot of logistical issues in dealing with the, the complexities of who was being treated where and what prescription they were on um, with different substance misuse services. So trying to facilitate um, sort of continuity of care and making sure people had access to substance misuse support services as and when they needed. So our, that, that's continued. So we've got a, we've got a phone line and an email open for, for anyone to contact us with substance misuse queries as they need. The second thing was delivering training. So we um, have delivered a series of webinars and produced a lot of protocols and, and information support for people working within the hotels and for service users in the hotels. Um, alongside a sort of psychosocial offer. So we've been able to deliver workbooks that we, that we produced as a, as a partnership um, to give people some kind of psychosocial um, drug and alcohol support in their hotel rooms over the course of the, uh, of the outbreak. Obviously people are pretty bored, some of them, in their hotels. Um, uh, and it's very difficult to get 
um, one on one key work or, or, um, or counselling opportunities given the pressure that uh, substance misuse services are under at the moment. So we sort of adapted materials that had been traditionally used in prisons um, and uh, made them more applicable uh, to the hotel setting and have, have uh, both got those out to hotels and translated them into languages that would be appropriate for those hotels. So um, yeah, training, uh, provision of a sort of advice or centralised advice line. And then the third thing we've done is provide stuff. So harm reduction materials. So we've been able to, um, so we, we have distributed out to all the hotels that, that have wanted it and that know about us, um, naloxone, the antidote to, um, to heroin and provided training. Uh, should there happen to be an opiate overdose in any of the hotels, which is perhaps as more likely um, given that there's, there's more methadone and buprenorphine swilling around the system. We've also provided lock boxes. So for people who uh, have a supply of, of a controlled drug, uh, such as methadone or buprenorphine on them, um, they need to have an individual lock box and it to be locked away and safely stored. Um, so sometimes we've been using hotel safes, um, but also we've been providing lock boxes where, where they've been needed. Um, needle and so clean needle and syringes for people who've been injecting, uh, and then also a whole bunch of nicotine products, so nicotine replacement therapies, but also um, donations of electronic cigarettes, which have gone down really, really well. So we've gotten about 1,500 electronic cigarettes out to um, to different hotels, which has meant that lots of people have re either reduced or, or completely stopped smoking, which is great, but also that they're not congregating outside hotels smoking, they're not at risk of fire setting in their rooms, and they're not sharing dog ends and, and much more likely to spread COVID. So that's been a really positive um, thing. Uh, so they're the sort of three things that we've provided. And as people now start to move on from the hotel network into, um, uh, into still temporary, but less temporary perhaps accommodation, uh, we're trying to facilitate that move as well to ensure that there's continuity of care between the substance misuse service that's currently providing treatment and the ones that are ultimately going to provide treatment in the um, in the borough or the local authority in which these people are placed. Um, so, um, so successes, we've gotten about 80 new people into treatment uh, and I guess the main one of the main successes that I've been reflecting on is that we, we don't often talk as substance misuse providers. We there is because of the nature of a piece of legislation passed in 2012 called the Health and Social Care Act, which um, sort of established more competition within the, um, the substance sector. There's ooh, um, sorry, someone's trying to mute me. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, but which established more competition within the um, substance misuse sector. There's often a lack of communication between substance misuse providers and what's been really excellent throughout this entire process is that we've uh, been communicating far better and more regularly and really collaboratively um, over the last three months. So we have fortnightly meetings with the sort of heads of all of our organisations to ensure that um, there are limited barriers to people accessing drug and alcohol services, particularly from this rough sleeping cohort, but I think it's also probably spilled over into general referrals um, uh, throughout London. Um, so I'll stop talking um, and uh, yeah, feel free to ask me any questions about our experiences over the last three months or things that we've learnt, things that we've done well, things that we've done not so well. Um, yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma. That was really helpful. Uh, and, and just again to repeat the welcome for people that have uh, joined recently. We've got uh, 113 participants, which is, which is fabulous. And it's lovely to see so many uh, old friends uh, rejoining us. Um, the, the plan is that for people to use the chat button to put up any questions, which we can uh, which we can collate and put put to the speakers as we uh, as as we go uh, as we go along. Um, I mean, it's what's occurring to me already is is that the, it is breathtaking the degree of collaboration that's that, that's been achieved here, and this sort of assertive. Um, encouragement of, of, of homeless patients to, to, to participate in, in, in these various treatment programs whereas previously you might have been forgiven for thinking that services were set up to select the more easily managed patients and, 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 and the locally connected patients and I've been to meetings where people have said well we, we don't commission service for street drug users in our borough most of them aren't locally connected and we're with the local authority now. So it's remarkable what's been, what, what's been achieved here. Um, do you think, was there a key 
element of that what was it was it was it the funding was it somebody giving you that title and saying make it so what what really made the difference so i think we it, i should point out that so even in normal times there there should be no restriction in terms of accessing local drug and alcohol support services so you you do not need it's similar to primary care in that you you don't have to disclose your immigration status you do not need any money you don't need a, a, to be registered with a gp you don't need a fixed address um, Obviously, that in, that those principles um, are can become muddied um, by various services and and sometimes some turf wars. I'm glad to say that hasn't happened during COVID, and I hope it continues not to uh, to happen going forward. I think it's just it's been a very positive, very open discussion, um, whereby um, we've had funding from public, we've had centralised funding, had very direct communication with our commissioners. Uh, and been able to come together collaboratively as a sector and deliver something that, that has been really needed. That's excellent, excellent to hear. Um, one sort of, there's, there's a sort of a, a collection of questions around cost. Um, that was there a, what was the additional cost in, involved in, in, in what were you doing? And, and, and is, there a, is there a finite, is there a bracket to that? When does it, when does it money run out and it all go back to normal? So we were initially commissioned for three months at a cost of £45,000 a month. Um, uh, so that was from March, uh, sorry, from April until July. And we've just had our contract extended for two months. There are discussions um, about whether or not the service will continue in some iteration after September. But uh, as far as we know at the moment, the, the end date is the beginning of September. Right. That, yeah, I guess there's, there's lots of discussion across all of the sectors about how we can keep the gains that, that, that have come from all of this. And it would be it would be lovely um, to, to, to think that we could carry things forward. Um, there's, there's a few sort of um, pharmaceutical questions, I, I guess, which we could uh, summarise as um, uh, could you, uh, what about naloxone and naloxone distribution and, 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 and were there overdoses and what about um, uh, buprenorphine as, as a preferred agent uh, and, and we're using Espronor um, and so naloxone, buprenorphine and then if we could go on to have a little bit of think about alcohol, were you prescribing alcohol to anybody kind of controlled drinking? So in terms of naloxone, yes we've distributed naloxone to pretty much every hotel that, that's wanted it and provided naloxone training both to professionals in, um, in hotels and also to, resi to, to the residents that wanted it. Um, in, in terms of, uh, in, so, so that all hotels now have a supply of naloxone and in theory, people there know how to use it um, uh, were there to be an overdose incident. Um, in terms of buprenorphine, so we've generally, so we're not a prescribing service. Um, we, we have advised on prescribing to either local healthcare teams on, um, uh, within the hotels themselves or um, through local drug and alcohol services. So they've continued generally their, their normal prescribing, although there's been a lot more rapid initiation of opiate substitution therapy because we've been able to get more people quickly into treatment um, and suddenly these people, you know, have a roof over their heads, uh, a phone in their hotel rooms, they are more easily contactable and it's, it's become easier to, to, to get people rapidly induced onto OST. Um, so we, we haven't sort of changed um, formulation prescribing, that's been done still by the local substance misuse treatment teams, so they have been using a mixture of methadone, buprenorphine and different formulations of buprenorphine including Espronor. I would say that um, in general where we've advised GP practices to prescribe uh, uh, within uh, hotels, we've used buprenorphine over methadone because of um, respiratory infection risks, um, particularly around COVID, but also reduced um, uh, overdose risks. Um, so the third one was alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol, yeah. So, so alcohol, um, we at the very beginning of the process, we had discussions with PHE and the various uh, hotel chains that were offering their services to, to house these people and made it very clear that in order for a hotel to be uh, sort of entered into the system, that hotels needed to uh, be wet essentially and allow drinking on premises and allow alcohol to be purchased and bought for, um, for residents. That has been largely happening across the hotels with one or two exceptions but where that's where those exceptions have been flagged up we've worked with the GLA and the hotel to try and uh, educate around uh, risks of uh, acute unplanned alcohol withdrawal uh, and why having alcohol in there is, is so essential so yes we have uh, we we have advised on providing alcohol uh, and um, 
various people have been purchased and bought alcohol in order to manage their, their dependence and not go into acute unplanned withdrawal. And we've provided guidance around um, amounts and frequencies of what to buy and matching unit for unit and safe reduction regimens in the hotel. Fantastic, thank you. That, that, it's really exciting to, to hear about all this, all this good stuff going on. Um, there's, there's sort of a, a collection of, of, of questions really about the competitive nature of service provision and how collaborative this has been because really I mean, you're kind of coordinating but you must have been asking each of the individual services to really step up the way in which they were willing to engage rapidly with, with, with patients, have different prescribing regimes, be, be, be more flexible. Is there anything that we can learn and, 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 and take forward about how we can keep that going? Yeah, I think so there's certainly been cases where a, uh, perhaps new hotels have opened in new boroughs or um, uh, new services have had to take on new, new residents that, that perhaps they weren't expecting in slightly larger numbers than they were expecting because people have been moved around London. Um, and there, there, have, there have been some resistance by, by some local authority services um, to, to accept those people. But having... So two things, I suppose. One is the fact that we have this meeting every two weeks with the heads of all the organisations and therefore have all of their emails. So they've been immediately able to ping off an email to the head of the organisation saying, uh, sort out your service in such and such. Um, and we've got people in very quickly that way. But the second thing I think that's really important is that from the outset, we had sort of cross provider principles. So we had a principle whereby if someone was currently under treatment in the service, irrespective of where they moved to within the hotel system, they would remain with that service to avoid sort of transfers of care, duplicate prescriptions, um, that kind of thing. Um, and that was really, really helpful. And I, I there, you know, there, it was a very useful forum to be able to quickly agree those kind of principles rapidly and mean that there wasn't any sort of faffing around um, uh, in order to keep people on prescriptions or get people into current treatment, situ uh, get people in current treatment services. Brilliant, because I mean, it really does seem to me that what what you've collectively achieved here is something that has been aspired to in London for, for, for years. You know, a, a collaborative London-wide provision which got over the postcode lottery and, and, and prioritised homeless patients. So you know, it really has been a fantastic achievement. Now, I'm very anxious that we, we stick to time. So what I'm going to propose is 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 Emma, if you can stick around, if you wouldn't mind scrolling through the through the questions that we haven't been able to respond to, and 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 if, if if there's anything there that you feel you could respond to if you're able to stick around uh, but we're going to see if we can get some uh john budd sorted now with his uh slide set and his microphone linked up um and uh, whilst we're getting the slide set up and getting john budd's microphone turned on i'll just repeat the welcome for those of you who've uh, uh joined us more recently it's lovely to see so many uh old friends um, uh, 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 joining us and the number of participants is going up rather than going down which means that it must have been at least moderately interesting which is encouraging. Um, uh, we're, we're aiming to finish by six o'clock we've just heard from Emmett Roberts in London and now we're going to hear from uh, John Budd at the uh, Edinburgh Access Practice uh, tell, us, uh, tell us about the uh, innovations that they've developed there. Uh, and I think hopefully Mo, who's our tech support, will have the um, PowerPoint slides ready to share. And then we can, uh, so we can all see uh, John there in his study. That's nice, good. And then hopefully the slides are going to appear. Uh, and the same principle will, will, will apply. Please uh, ask any, any questions for, for John on the, uh, on the, on the chat uh, box as, 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 we, as, as we go along. Uh, and we'll... Um, uh, summarize the questions uh, at the at the end of the, the next 15 minutes uh, session and put, put them all up remarkable this does seem to be this does seem to be working if you find that your um you know the the the, the pictures of, of of the of, of the speakers is is obscuring this you can uh, there's a little button that says hide the thumbnail video so you can just see the slides thank you over to you john Oh, that's great. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, just checking. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Um, well, thanks for inviting me to participate in the in the meeting tonight. It's all very exciting and great to hear what's happening in London on a rather different scale, perhaps, to what's happening here in Edinburgh. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what uh, the response in terms of the COVID crisis that we've been involved with at the Access Practice, which is GP practice for people that are, find themselves in homelessness here in Edinburgh. Um, I don't know if the slides are up. I'm not seeing them, but um, 
it probably doesn't matter if they are or aren't. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 I'm seeing them. Um, okay. Do, do I uh, change them by just saying? Yeah, just say next, next line, <laughs> okay. please. Oh, I can see them. It's a miracle. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, right. I think we can probably go to the next slide. Thanks. I mean, I'll breeze through these pretty quick because uh, I think we're all pretty much uh, on the same sheet with this. Um, I guess people that are homeless have uh, been identified as a high risk group for COVID in terms of acquiring the infection and also for adverse outcomes. And the whole social determinants of health goes back a long, long way. And this is from a book I picked up around the corner in a bookshop from Engels, when he, which he wrote when he was 24 about the uh, working living conditions of the working, the workers in England. Uh, so we can go on to the next, next slide, thanks. That was been updated really in the, the Hard Edges report, which is familiar to, to everyone, I'm sure, in 2015, um, that those who really experience the extremes of ill health are those who are most marginalized. So we can go to the next slide, thanks. And uh, they talk a little bit about in the hard edges about why it is those who are in homelessness in particular experience such adversity and the, the degree of dislocation and uh, stigma that uh, folk experience. So next slide. And you'll be very familiar with what that translates into, into the, uh, into the ill health burden of our patients. And this is from an audit we did in 2016, looking at the health profile of the patients registered with us. And we have a, um, an average age of our population of just under 40, but with a burden of disease that you'd expect to see in a population probably in their late eighties, although different uh, health conditions. Next slide, thanks. And obviously, as you know, the papers in the Lancet and numerous papers have uh, highlighted, that ultimately translates into a burden of extreme premature mortality. So we can see why people that are homeless would have been identified as a potentially high risk group for COVID. So next, next slide. So I think we found it really helpful, uh, our stories and Andrew Hayward's papers and the updated versions since March. Uh, and again, many of you will have seen this. Um, it's really helped us think through with our housing and public health colleagues, how we can try and provide accommodation that will enable our, uh, those who are in, in experiencing homelessness, how they might be able to keep themselves safe and how we might be able to provide care for them. And uh, we didn't get so far with the COVID protect bits, although we've kind of a little bit down that road, but we certainly were able to set up the uh, COVID care model. And that was uh, utilizing uh, local hotels. The next slide, thanks. Um, so the response up here in Edinburgh started to kick in really around the middle of March. We're obviously b behind you guys in London. Um, and that really, a few of the areas that I was going to touch on today, but housing, uh, particularly outreach, which uh, Emmett's talked a little bit about, um, and also one or two other developments that we've been trying to push for over the years and have finally been able to make some headway um, under the sort of uh, COVID umbrella. So next slide, thanks. So there have been uh, 560 plus, well, it's probably more like 600 folk uh, accommodated in different forms of emergency accommodation. And that's kind of uh, varied between large hotels in the center of town and a few smaller ones, as well as some direct access hostels and other forms of temporary accommodation. That sort of accommodation has been run and, and um, and residents supported uh, through work, particularly with street work, a local organization, and Bethany, who, uh, who run the night shelter here in Edinburgh. And I mean, they've been fantastic in getting things set up really quickly, in working in new ways, and enabling us from the health service um, to really link in effectively in a way that we've never really been able to link in before. Um, and I think, you know, can't really say enough in praise of our uh, third sector partners and also our housing, our local authority housing. We're really incredibly supportive straight from the go-get and um, really got the issues straight away. And working with public health, we were able to actually get things in place in a way that, you know, I wouldn't have believed six months ago. 
So we, uh, we, we set up a, um, a pathway for all folk in homelessness and different forms of homeless accommodation across Edinburgh uh, for early identification of for those who are symptomatic for COVID, um, testing folk where they were in situ, um, identifying whether they would, were able to I isolate effectively and that was not just around their accommodation if they're in a B&B &B or in a larger hostel or rough sleeping but also in terms of their mental health and then the uh, behavioral issues such as addictions that would really significantly limit their ability to keep themselves safe and isolate and then if they weren't able to do that they were fast tracked into our uh, uh, COVID care units where we had I isolation rooms where we waited for the uh, COVID swab results and then if they were positive they moved up into our cohorting um, unit. We had uh, 24 bedded, two 12 bedded uh, units where folk could uh, reside for the seven days post symptom starting or for a further 48 hours post, uh, post fever. I'd have to say we didn't have to use that once, <laughs> which which is great, but also can't, I must say, there's a tinge of disappointment too. Uh, so, um, but the, the system was in place and is still in place, um, which is the main thing. So ne ne next slide. We, it generated quite a lot of antibodies here in the practice about how we should respond as a practice to, uh, to, to COVID. Um, many GP practices across the town shut their doors and were only really dealing with patients by phone or in limited uh, cases they would actually see folk face to face. There was a huge drop off in mainstream general practice in terms of uh, home visits and things like that. We took the uh, decision that actually we really needed to be out alongside our third sector partners, alongside our patients and so we use it as an opportunity to set up outreach clinics in multiple different uh, sites. Our COVID care unit, which was uh, part of an 80 bedded hotel, which is still in operation at the moment. Um, we had a daily clinic down there with nurse, GP. Um, we had got our harm reduction colleagues coming in there, testing for bloodborne viruses. Uh, we had a weekly sexual health clinic in there running as well. We had a room that we, we carried our examination couch down to from our practice and set that up. So we had a really good little uh, medical health nurse uh, practice uh, uh, treatment room, um, as well as isolation room set up where we could put people in. Uh, who are awaiting uh, test results for, for, for COVID. So we were testing people ourselves and working with public health who has established a community testing team for people that were homeless. Um, we did um, Salvation Army colleagues kept one of the day centres running so we were in there twice a week. Um, one of our CPNs in particular uh, has been fantastic in terms of uh, a, really assertive outreach in Across the, across the town, uh, working with other colleagues in the practice and from the harm reduction. So we're really aiming to fast track same day treatment for anyone who uh, is opioid dependent and wanted it, particularly to enable them to keep themselves safe. So recognizing that people can't social distance, can't uh, keep themselves in a safe place if they're running around looking for drugs and alcohol. So we probably closer to 40 folk uh, initiated onto OST, the vast majority on the same day. And the vast majority are still in treatment. We haven't had any, uh, we had I think one overdose of one of those, but no fatal overdoses. And certainly for the first month of um, this being set up, we did see a reduction in non-fatal overdoses. I mean, things across Edinburgh have since picked up and have looking back towards more like normal but certainly we I don't think we've had any fatal overdoses uh, over the period. Uh, we've uh, our colleagues street work that run the uh, hotel where we've got our COVID cohorting unit uh, we managed to get uh, them issued with vapes or e-cigarettes from public health something public health have been talking about for the last couple of years they were able to do it within a couple of weeks not on the scale that you guys know but a couple of vapes went straight out we're trying to get more trying to get uh, uh, 
those vapes into different homeless settings because recognizing again that an eighth to people to social distance keep themselves safe in their rooms so much more effective with vapes rather than uh, people having to go off to smoke one of our mental health nurses has been uh, off the mark very quickly in terms of setting up telehealth so we were able to get some charitable funding and buy um, four laptops we've put in different uh, homeless accommodation units and then we've had workers from the practice linking up each afternoon evening offering uh, mental health assessment support as well as other folk we've had our uh, um, welfare rights and various other people that have used that to uh, see people remotely uh, and that's for me I'm a bit skeptical of that but it, it's actually worked really well and I think certainly uh, partner agencies have found that uh, you know very supportive and um, the practice doors did keep open we were working in a modified way but we've kept the practice doors open throughout the crisis uh, next slide please so one uh, one of the uh, successes that we've been able to get off the ground is again under the COVID umbrella to try and free up COVID capacity in the hospitals is to set up a uh, intermediary care unit in, a, in, a, in an old HIV hospice, which is uh, being used for broader things now, but really wasn't being utilized uh, to the extent it could have been. So we've got a 10 bedded unit set up there. Uh, great support from public health and helping set that up. Really good support from our regional infectious disease unit. Many of the folk, uh, we've had actually 13 people uh, in the last seven weeks admitted, some for longer, some for shorter periods, um, and it's enabled people to be discharged safely from hospital at an earlier time, and then look at their, you know, titrate them up on uh, opioid substitute treatment, look at their mental health, social issues, link them in with housing support, and uh, we're really hoping we're gonna be able to continue that uh, into the future. Next slide, please. And the, we've been doing quite a lot of work with our alcohol and drug partnership, which is the Quango that controls the money for that, um, who've been in very supportive in trying to establish a managed alcohol program. So uh, we've got it all written up. We've linked in with uh, Sterling University Center for Addiction Studies, who've done some research looking at what a managed alcohol program would look like in a Scottish context. And we are ready to go. There is money there. We're looking at a place with a 14 bedded unit. We just need to go ahead from the uh, core group, I think, from the Alcohol Drug Partnership. The idea was, would be that it would, uh, it would be a safe accommodation for people that are rattling around the system with long-term alcohol dependence, for whom abstinence is either not a chosen route or not feasible. And it's to enable, it's very much a harm reduction intervention with the provision of alcohol in a managed way that enables people to reduce their harms uh, and engage in, in support and treatment for a range of issues, not just alcohol. So we're really hoping we'll be able to get that up and running in the next few weeks, but I'll uh, keep you posted. Uh, next slide, please. We've also had a managed to get a uh, link up a group of about 30 students or so who've been uh, who've been great I and mean, we haven't really utilized them as much as we we would have wanted to be honest but um, we've got them involved in delivering prescriptions around pharmacies in methadone deliveries to people that are isolating uh, we've had them in doing admin work at the practice when we were really short of staff early on and uh, we've got four of the new uh, first year doctors who've been fast tracked onto the medical register doing outreach clinics in uh, in one of the in one of the main uh, hotels that's being used uh, for the care shelter here in edinburgh and i think that's been a really positive experience for for them as well as being a real opportunity for them to contribute it's also we've tried to engage the students as well in a in an education program so we've got an hourly zoom event in fact it's on at the moment uh, oh no sorry it's on on thursday um looking at issues around uh, inclusion health and the psychology of deprivation and trauma-informed practice and harm reduction and things that the uh, medical uh, curriculum undergraduate doesn't cover so uh, and we've had between 16 and or so students linking in on a weekly basis for that so so that's been a really positive thing again saying we hope to continue yep. 
next slide please and uh, yeah just to say <laughs> we've only had one patient confirmed covid positive <laughs> so which i don't know it's it seems a, mir a miracle but uh, given how you know there are reports in different populations in different places of high rates of infection and particularly adverse outcomes for homeless shelter users in new york that hasn't been our experience yet and, and, and we hope it remains that way next slide please Yep, so our big issue is, you know, government in here in Scotland have made a lot of positive noises about folk not being returned to the streets. Uh, yeah, no definite plan in place, but things are moving in a positive direction. Um, really hope we get the managed alcohol programme. But again, as been already highlighted, I think the, uh, what for, the, for, for all of us, I think, uh, has been the real highlight and learning opportunity has been the joint working, particularly between ourselves uh, in the NHS and our voluntary sector colleagues. Uh, that really has been absolutely outstanding. And it's, you know, I think it's really opened our eyes to, to, to how we need to be working in new ways in much more flexible, responsive, uh, collegiate ways with our third sector partners in particular. And also public health, actually, that's been a real revelation too, I must say. Uh, next slide. A couple of quick reflections. Why only one infected patient? Uh, and I just wonder, for our, to what extent does it really reflect the deep extent of exclusion from the mainstream of, of life for many of our patients? Uh, issue about what happens with folk who have no recourse to public funds. Again, I don't think there's any particular plans in place about what's going to happen there. Um, and then uh, I can't read the last thing there, so I have to move on to the last one. Oh, time for headspace. Yeah, I think it's one of the things chatting to patients, you know, some patients have really appreciated a, a safe place to, to actually reflect on things a little bit, get into treatment. We've done quite a lot, we've done quite a lot of alcohol detoxes for folk, initiate folk into for treatment for mental health issues as well as physical health, and they get substitute treatment, as I said. That's kind of taken the pressure off a lot of people, I think, and certainly, Chatting to a chap earlier this earlier this week in in the one of our H clinics, you know, enabled him to reframe things a little bit and really positive about going forward. And he's due to start his Hep C treatment actually next week as a result of his experience over the past few weeks. And finally, I think the last slide. I I think for me the um the, the my last slide for me the the me the 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 uh, the key thing about this time has been it's been a real opportunity to show solidarity both both to our voluntary sector partners but also and more importantly with our patients and i think the fact that we've kept the doors open that we've gone out it's been hugely important and i know services that haven't done that i i think that's such a missed opportunity uh, we talk about the co-production of health and, and it feels like we've taken a step towards that with many of our partners and uh, patients through through this time of COVID. That's me. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, John. That was uh, really uh, excellent to hear about and an inspiring, inspiring story. We've just got a, a couple of minutes to try and collate some, some questions that have been coming up on, 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 on the chat room. I think my impression in, in, in Leicester and talking to lots of, of, of other people is that, that yeah, this has been an opportunity for a period of, of stability. Um, and I was interested that the, you hadn't had any fatal overdoses. Had the, has there been a problem with, with drug dealing? That's a question that's come up and, and uh, particularly fentanyl dealing uh, around the new facilities. Is that something you've, you've, you've had to tackle? Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I think you're on. Um, sorry. <laughs> so actually, uh, just a colleague trying to bust in there. Um, we, fentanyl is not something we've seen up here at all, actually, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I've only seen one or two patients in 
years who've used fentanyl. We have had problems with, um, in terms of illicit benzodiazepines. That's been much, a much bigger problem for us. Uh, and we've seen increased dealing of that uh, around the emergency accommodation. And certainly increasingly in Scotland, uh, illicit benzos have been featuring in drug-related deaths. Um, I was chatting to someone, uh, again, a, a patient earlier this week, uh, who was telling me that actually he thinks that actually there's much less in the way of benzos in the last week or two. Um, but that's been the main issue. A lot of patients, we, we've also taken, you know, changed the dispensing arrangements, um, not giving people more than a week's worth. And for most people, it's, it's just a couple of days worth of opiate substitute treatment at a time. And, and the impression on the whole is that people have managed that really well and, you know, again, have appreciated um, taking that responsibility and being trusted with that. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, there's, we've got a quite, quite a nice um, uh, wrap up question, which, which I'd like to ask you, then go back to, to, to Emma, just to give them the opportunity to, to discuss the, the overdose, uh, the, the, the drug dealing issue in, in London. It's very interesting how localised the patterns of uh, the sale of unabusable drugs are. Uh, but the, the, the good question is, what single thing would make the difference to not going back again in partnership collaborations? Uh, how can we, how can we <laughs> preserve all of this good stuff? <laughs> yeah, um, good question. Uh, uh, I think, I guess, I, well, I can only speak for myself. I think once we, you, you know, we've experienced a different way of working, you know, it, it's very hard to go back, actually. I, I, I think we, I don't know if we'll accept the idea of going back to the way we worked in a, in a you know, not that it's wrong how, what we were doing before, it's just limited. And we need to have a much broader vision of how we offer services and engage with engage with our, our patient group and service users. And, and I think once you've got that, I think it's, you know, then you are freed up. We've had that experience. We'll now feel a bit freer to think a bit more creatively. Um, and I, yeah, and we need management buy-in. I mean, I, I would have to say one of the difficulties I think we've had is, is, is uh, taking our management and um, our whole service with us. But I think on the whole, the experience has been really positive. My colleagues might disagree. <laughs> um, so again, I think there's been an education for all of us that we can't, you know, we can't go back. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm seeing, great to see you leading from the front. Just to go back briefly to, 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 to Emma, just on the, on the two things, the, the issue of, of, of drug dealing around the, around the hotels um, and, and, and if, whether you've got any kind of one thing which would, we could hold on to, to for going forward for the future. So similarly, we've not seen a huge problem with fentanyl. Um, uh, I know that from, you know, sort of national PHE reports, there's been very patchy, relatively minimal reporting of, of fentanyl across the country, but we've certainly not had um, it as a problem in the hotel system here. Um, and in terms of drug dealing, again, we've not had um, substantial reports of drug dealing um, or, or drug dealing that has been raised to the that has caused any issues in terms of evictions or anything like that from the, from the hotels. The, 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 the number one substance that we're called about um, uh, with regards to residents in the hotels is alcohol. Um, and I think that, that obviously reflects the population that we're dealing with and reflects the, the, um, the prevalence of alcohol use disorders, both nationally, but particularly within this population. Mm. Um, and what single thing would make a difference? I don't think there is one, um, which is not a particularly helpful or, or useful answer. Um, I, I think that, yeah, I, I would, I would echo John's points around leadership. So I, I think that there has been reasonably strong leadership from PHE London in, in establishing this, this service and letting us get on with it. What I worry about in the, in the treatment sector at the moment is be, because of the sort of fractiousness of it and because of uh, the sort of discrepancy between the NHS and voluntary sector organizations, there's limited ability to train sort of the next generation of addiction psychiatrists or the next generation of addiction nurses. And I think we're gonna be in a really, really difficult position come you know, five, 10 years down the line with, with few clinical leaders in the addiction field in the UK, and that's gonna be a huge problem. I mean, you know, it, to sort of parrot what I'm sure everyone would say if they're asked this question, you know, we just need to talk to each other more and we have been talking to each other more during COVID and we need to keep doing that, but I don't think there is a single thing. Brilliant. No, well, thank you. So no going back. 
So uh, Alex, as usual, gets the, the short straw of, uh, of what time is available at the end of the meeting, just to give us a bit of a wrap up and, and, and bring us up to speed with what, what's been happening with, uh, with, 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 with Pathway, the, the, our host charity. Thank you, Alex. Just unmute myself. Thank, thank you. Lovely to see you, John. Thanks, Emmett. Fabulous work. Um, I guess I, I thought I should just first say to everyone on the call, thank you for everything you've done, because certainly everything we hear across the country, there's been some absolutely amazing change and practice, which, yeah, who, who would have thought all we needed was a global pandemic in order to change things for the better. Um, but let's take every opportunity as we can. So again, just thanks to everyone for all of the work that you've been doing over this period, because I know a lot of people have been going way, way above and beyond what might be expected of of normal times um, and it's been incredibly impressive to watch I've been watching most of it from zoom or these weird environments but for the clinicians and colleagues from the third sector out there on the street absolutely amazing work so thank you um, John mentioned the conference so I wanted just to share with you we are reflecting on some people on the call were at the conference we had back in March where Al Story and Andrew Haywood we turned the second day over to talk about COVID as it was coming at us seemed the right thing to do at the time and I think looking back it definitely was that plan has been picked up and used by people in lots of different ways in different parts of the country. We're hoping to get some research funding to have a look at I guess how and why that happened in a way it was a bit of guerrilla planning really and that we just put it out and then people started following it, and then we refreshed and put it out. In the end the government has never actually managed or bothered you could say to publish it themselves but when the, U the England Housing Minister wrote to all UK local authorities recently, he referenced that plan um, on Pathways website, which was interesting because we'd been lobbying them to publish it themselves, but they never did. So perhaps sometimes we look to government to do more than it. Sometimes maybe we can just do it ourselves if, if we're in the right position and the right setup. Um, but for our conference next year, we're obviously wondering what to do, wondering about Zoom and wondering how these events feel to people. So we're very, very keen, if you had a moment, to say what you feel about these electronic channels. Um, we're not committed to a date, but if we were to run a conference next March, believe it or not, we'd be planning it now and we'd be inviting people for papers now. Um, so I think whatever happens, we're slightly to slip it back a bit. Personally, I would love the time to come back around again when we could meet together in a room sometimes and enjoy people's physical company as well as through these channels. But so your views, please, on whether we should do more of these events in the interim and whether and when we should focus on our next conference and any topics you think we should feature on. We always try and listen to people. What are the, what are the hot topics which we should focus on this time around? I guess it might be the remains and a look back at a global pandemic seems like a likely topic. Um, so that's the conference. One specific thing I want to say, share from Pathway, we've been working with colleagues with some funding from the Health Foundation across the country to try and persuade people to join what we've called a social franchise to take on the Pathway team in the hospital idea. And I'm delighted just to share with you that Hull CCG have just this week signed a contract with us, which is our first one to actually ink in a contract. Um, very exciting for us only about another 65 to go so hey it gives us something to do um and the last thing i thought i'd refer people to people may have seen i think it's more england relevant than scotland but i know they're active in scotland too crisis last week launched a new campaign they've published some draft legislation which they're trying to push which will tackle seeks a number of things but particularly seeks action on no recourse to public funds to try and take away that stupid barrier to care and to housing. Um, if you go to the crisis website, there's a letter to your MP. You can download, fill in, sign up. Um, and there's all sorts of tools there. We've been trying to encourage that. We're going to try and provoke, promote a joint response from faculty members. So um, please let us know if you are in favor of it. We'll try and find a way for you to do that with us. Um, but yeah, I'd encourage you to get involved with that campaign because I think the government is slightly fluid at the moment. Things can change. And again, there's an opportunity here to keep some pressure on um, real worries around what's going to happen otherwise as we look at the wider economic circumstances. So I think that was it from me.
just a last plug if you go to the pathway website to the faculty pages you can sign up for the faculty mailing list and if you click the subscribe button you can give us some money if you felt so moved um i'm going to pass you back to nigel and thanks john thanks emmett really interesting stuff fantastic thank you yeah so i'm just i'm going to round round up with, with some thank yous particular thank yous to our speakers emmett roberts and, and john buds and uh, alex Bax, you, you've just heard from thanks to, to mo our tech support uh, and, and eve uh, eve who's do, been doing the comms hi to adrian gillen in sydney australia who's been attending with us uh, although it's two in the morning up there and uh, thank you all for uh, for your participation not for zoom bombing us uh, and we'll look forward to the, seeing you all again at the next meeting soon thank you and goodbye I got cut off, so <laughs> the meeting suddenly gone blank.